today we're going to talk about telescopes, astronomical instruments. Um, we are not quite into astronomy and probably what you want to learn about yet, um, but in order to understand the things we're going to le learn about, it helps to understand the instruments we use to make those uh, observations. So this chapter is on um, trying to understand telescopes and how they work. And so we've got uh, these radio telescopes pointed at the sky. They look like satellite dishes. They don't look like traditional telescopes. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is telescopes, modern telescopes, uh, how telescopes make the measurements um, of visible light, how they make measurements of radio waves, uh, what we need to do sometimes to get a telescope to see certain wavelengths. We have to get them above the atmosphere. Um, and then the future. So, hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. At night, though, even under the darkest sky, there's a limit to how faint uh, your eye can see to, de to detect. The, there's a limit to what it can see. Out of all those hundreds of billions of stars, there are only 9,096 stars bright enough that you can see with your naked eye. That's in the entire universe, okay? So that's about, if you take half of that, it's about 4,500 stars on a given night that you can see, 4,500. That's not that many if you think about it. Um, so this chapter is dedicated to understanding the tools we use to see all of the stars, to go beyond those of what our eyes can see and to experience the full electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so, since we can see about 4,000 stars on a dark sky, if you just get a simple set of binoculars, you can now see over 100,000 stars on a given night. Um, if you go to a 3-inch telescope, you can see now more than 2 million stars. You can gather enough light to do that with a small telescope. If you go to a 15-inch telescope, now we're talking about 150 million stars available to your optical system. Look at this though. If there are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, even with a 15-inch telescope we can only see 0.03% of all the stars in our entire galaxy. I'm, I think I did that math right. You take 150 million, divide by uh, 400 billion, and then uh, calculate that percentage. So we need some big telescopes if we want to see all the things that are available to us in the universe. So our learning objectives today, it, we want to understand how a telescope works, what are the, mo the main components of a telescope, um, the main functions of a telescope, and uh, the two basic types of telescopes and how they form images. Um, so there's three components to a telescope. The first one is the aperture, how big is the hole that the light goes into, um, and then filters that separate the light, red filters, green, blue, depending on what wavelength you want to look at, you can filter that light out. Um, or you can put a prism in, which splits it into a rainbow, and then you can do spectroscopy. Um, and then you need a detector. So you've got your light gathering component, you've got filters to split the light up, and then you've got a detector. Sometimes it's your own eyeball, sometimes it's a camera, uh, to record uh, the light. So this is an example of uh, the Orion constellation. This is what it looks like on the night sky if you just looked up under visible light. If you use an x-ray telescope, you can see there's something right here that is not invisible. So something there is shooting x-rays at us, but our eyes can't see it, but an x-ray telescope can. And this is what it looks like in infrared. Um, there's the Orion Nebula. You can kind of see it here in the visible light, but you can really see it in infrared. Okay, so this is why telescopes um, need to have the ability to focus different uh, wavelengths of light, radio, infrared, x-ray. So we need all different types of telescopes to do that. Um, the most important function of a telescope is to collect light. A lot of these images um, that you see are big on the sky. You, if they were bright enough, you'd be able to see them with your naked eye. Like the Orion Nebula, you should be able to see with your naked eye uh, if it was bright enough, but it's so dim that it's hard for us to see it. The Andromeda Galaxy is six full moons, that means take your thumb at arm's length, count six of them. Um, that's how big the Andromeda Galaxy is on the night sky, but it's too faint for our eyes to see it uh, most of the time. Um, it just looks like a little smudge if, you're, if you know where to look. 
Um, so that's the most important function of a telescope is to collect light. The more light a telescope can collect, the fainter the object is that you can see so you can look deeper into space or look at faint things that are closer. Visible light telescopes. Now when we say visible light, that just means Roy G. Biv. It means the rainbow. It means light that our eyes can see. Visible light telescopes use lenses and mirrors as the main thing to manipulate light. Um, when you increase the aperture, the amount of light you collect goes up like the diameter squared. So if you have a one meter telescope and you go to a four meter telescope, you'd think, wow, it's four times bigger, but it's actually 16 times more four squared. It's four times bigger, four squared bigger um, amount of light it can collect. So even a small increase in aperture uh, increases the light collecting power by a, a huge amount. Um, so lenses. Lenses cause light to refract, like glasses on your face, um, and a prism. And it, we can use lenses to focus light. Your eye has a lens in it. Uh, sometimes we need to correct the lens with glasses, other lenses. Um, the point where a lens focuses light from a distant object is called uh, the focal point of the lens. Um, this is basically the general idea. You have light rays coming into a lens, and it focuses those light rays to a point, and that's called the focal length. And that's just what we call image formation. Your image would be here at the focal point um, or the focus. And that's how a telescope works. When it, you just put a lens somewhere, it takes light from faint things and focuses it, combines all those rays to a single point and, and makes it brighter. So we consider rays of light from distant stars to enter a telescope as parallel rays because the stars are so far away. Uh, far away. This sounds a little bit weird um, to you, but uh, if you think about it, if you have a light source like this, and you can think of light rays emanating from it, those rays aren't parallel. Uh, what a parallel ray is is when they're next to each other like that, in straight lines. Um, so if our star is here, it's emitting light in all directions. But if you're really far away and you put your lens here, um, those rays that leave are so close to each other that they're almost like parallel rays uh, when they reach us. So this is a little bit of a sciencey thing to talk about, um, and a little bit may seem a little bit weird, but the idea is just that you know you may be wondering why, or you may not be, uh, but you may be wondering why we treat rays from something as coming in parallel and then focusing, and it's just because when it's far enough away. Um, it behaves almost like parallel rays coming in. So, that's you, if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, it's, you're, you're going to be okay. <laughs> um, but I would get in trouble if I didn't mention it by other nerds. Okay, so when you think of a telescope, what, uh, you know, uh, pirates hold, you know, these telescopes and they're looking around, um, that type of telescope is called a refractor. So when you hear that word, you should think of telescope, and you could think of the physics term refraction, which is when light bends, like in a prism. Um, refraction occurs in a refractor by refracting the light. Um, so a refractor telescope contains lenses. Okay, we're learning about telescopes, right? So what do you care about? There's a type of telescope that's a tube with lenses in it. That's it. This is a refractor. That's what it looks like. So that's the traditional telescope. When you think of a telescope, you are probably thinking of a refractor. And if you look inside, there's a lens. The light rays come in parallel and then get focused. And then there's a lens out here, the eyepiece that you put your eye in and look at. So that's a refractor telescope. Um, since lenses use refraction, and if you recall, prisms can, use, can be used to split light up into colors, then there is a potential problem using lenses in a telescope, and that problem is called chromatic aberration. Okay, chromatic aberration occurs when a lens exhibits prism-like behavior. It splits light up into rainbow colors instead of focusing it into a single point. Um, you don't want that in a lens that is not a prism. Um, if you buy, you know, if you're into photography and you'll notice that there's like cheap lenses and expensive lenses, What's the difference? Usually the amount of chromatic aberration. That's one thing, an expensive lens. Um, there's extra lenses in there to fix that. 
Um, this is chromatic aberration. You have white light coming in, which is the combination of colors. But just like a prism splits light into a rainbow, you can see the blue light focuses here, green light focuses there, red light focuses here. So they don't all focus at the same point. They smear out, and your, your image kind of gets this you know, weird little uh, splitting of the colors uh, on the borders of things. So if there's a lot of light and you're, you know, some lenses you don't notice it too much, but other lenses it's really bad. And depending on the conditions that you're in shooting, what type of images you're shooting, you can get a problem. So anyway, that's just something you need to be aware of. All right, and, and why you should pay a little bit more to get a better lens because if you get a telescope that's weird like that and you try to do astrophotography and you get these weird images where everything's smeared out, ugh, that's annoying. Okay, so another type of telescope, instead of using lenses, uses mirrors. So these are your two main types of telescopes. Now when you retire someday, you're going to buy a telescope, so that's why we talk about this so you know what to purchase. This type of telescope is a reflector and the most common type of reflector, right, that uses a mirror to reflect light is the Newtonian reflector. It's something Newton made. So there's two main types that depend on where the image is viewed. Okay, um, The prime focus, which means you'd put your camera up here in the tube. Um, the Newtonian focus, which means you'd look here and you put your camera on the end um, towards the top. And then there's the Cassegrain focus where you look out the back of this and you put your eye down there. Okay, So those are the three types of reflector telescopes. They've, these are all mirrors, um, no lenses in there. And this is an example of a Newtonian, and you can see the eyepiece is up here at eye level. Light comes in, reflects off the back, hits the mirror in the middle, and gets deflected out at a nice comfortable viewing angle. And here's another one. You can see um, the light comes in, bounces off the back, up to here, and then out. There's the eyepiece that this guy would put his face up against. And go ooh and ah. This is a Cassegrain. Um, type of telescope, so the light comes in, bounces off the mirror in the back, hits this mirror in the middle, and comes out the back, and that's where you put your eye. So your eyeball would be here, and you'd look at the light coming out um, there. So that's the Cassegrain style. This thing up here is called the finder scope, and that's just something you use. It's like a, the um, sight for aiming the telescope. It's a uh, low magnification, allows you to point the telescope at a point in the sky, and uh, so that's what that is. So those are the main two types of telescopes. So which one should you buy? Um, refractors are small, they're portable, and they're great for planets because planets are bright, you don't need a large aperture to see them. Okay, so if you want to look at planets, Mars, you want to look at the polar ice caps, you want to look at the cloud bands of Jupiter, you want to look at the rings of Saturn, a refractor is perfect for that, um, but if you want to look at a nebula or take pictures of galaxies or anything like that, you're going to want a Newtonian or a Cassegrain. Why? Because it's cheaper to make them with large apertures to collect all that faint light. You need a large aperture to collect the light um, of faint objects. So my recommendation, the best bang for your buck and the overall thing, is the Cassegrain reflector. So the Cassegrain style is a little bit like a MacBook, okay? There, Apple doesn't make a cheap laptop. A Cassegrain, there is no such thing as a cheap one. There are, so there's a li they're a little bit higher cost, but you can equally do, you can put filters on to look at the moon, you can look at planets, you can look at galaxies. They're an overall uh, just a better system, and they're a newer design, so they, uh, I recommend that one if you're going to get one. So, uh, moving on to 6.2. Da, 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 da. Um, 6.2 is about uh, telescopes today. And telescopes today, we want to just learn what's out there. We want to talk about why are, why are telescopes where they are around the world. And we want to explain how adaptive optics works and why it's important. So. Um, these are telescopes that are yet to be built, um, and this is the extremely large telescope uh, being built in Chile. Um, this is the 30 meter telescope. There's uh, ongoing uh, plans to build this one in Hawaii. Then the uh, uh, Great or the Giant Magellan Telescope again in Chile, the Salt Telescope in Africa and the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Um, those are some of the 
main ones. There's a whole list here in the uh, in the textbook of all the different uh, telescopes. Um, but these telescopes typically they're hundreds of millions of dollars, so you need to pay attention to where you're going to build one of these things. The most important factor in determining where you're going to build this um, is what you care about. This is why we're talking about this. So you need to take this away. You need a site where it's clear most of the time. The University of Iowa has a robotic telescope in Arizona because most of the night skies in Iowa are covered in clouds at some point, almost every day of the year. So that's not great for observing. So we, uh, not we, but at the University of Iowa, they have a, a robotic telescope that runs at night in Arizona where it's in the desert, it's dry, um, there aren't a lot of clouds. So um, it, it made sense to do that. So you want clear skies for 75% of the year. Not a lot of chances for rain, clouds, fog, any of that. You also want to be high in the air. Gravity pulls the atmosphere close to the surface of the Earth. So the higher you go up into the air, the thinner it gets. And you know that if you've ever been in, in Denver or up in the mountains in Colorado. Um, some people have get altitude sickness, the air gets thinner. Um, so the reason you want to get high in the atmosphere is because it gets thinner. Atmosphere causes blurry images. So if you want a nice clear image, you want to be high in the atmosphere to get through as much of the atmosphere as possible. You also want to be far from cities. So you want to be in the middle of nowhere so you don't have light pollution. So um, this is the... Um, uh, one of the main observatories, one of the big observatories in Chile where a lot of those other telescopes are going to be built, um, Cerro Peranal in Chile. It, this is just in the middle of nowhere, high up in a mountain. Um, the takeaway is high, dry, and dark. Uh, that's where you want your telescopes to be. High in the air, dry, not a lot of water vapor, make the atmosphere cloudy and all that stuff, and uh, dark far from anyone else. So that's a great site for that and that's why they are there. So the next most important thing after the light gathering capability of a telescope is the resolution. And you know when you buy a camera how many megapixels is it? You want to see good detail. It's the smallest detail a telescope can observe. That's what the resolution is. Um, for a long time the resolutions of telescopes that were on the surface of the earth were limited by the atmosphere. You could put the best optics in the world on it, uh, the highest resolution cameras, but eventually it got blurry and uh, it was because of the atmosphere. You couldn't do anything about it. But since computers came along and microcontrollers and high-speed chips and everything, we use something called adaptive optics. This is an important part of ground-based telescopes. You have probably heard about the Hubble Space Telescope. It's in space. You may be wondering why there aren't other ones. Why is that the only one? Why has it been up since 1993 and why hasn't, or 91 or 90 or whenever it was, and why haven't uh, we sent more up? The reason is adaptive optics. We put Hubble in space to get above the atmosphere for clear images. But with adaptive optics, we, we get images just as good as Hubble from the Earth. So that's a big deal. And adaptive optics is what um, we use to do that. So um, the atmosphere, you could have rays of light coming in to the atmosphere, but you see how once it hits these drops of water vapor, the light wave gets ripply, and then by the time it gets your telescope, it's all distorted. Okay, so what if we could counteract that effect? So um, this, you know, there's a there's a term when you're going to go observing. People people will ask you, well, what's the seeing tonight? Or you'll you'll ask, what's the astronomical seeing tonight? And that's basically how clear the skies are. The winter is great for observing because the air is less dense. Um, uh, uh, sorry, more dense. It's less. There's less water vapor in it. Um, the uh, skies are a lot clearer. I mean, you may notice this in the winter if you look up at the sky. It twinkles a little bit more. There seems to be the stars a little bit brighter. Um, so the seeing is better in the winter in general, um, when the air is drier. But this is the limit that the resolution due to the atmosphere. Space-based telescopes, you get above all that. So you don't worry about it. But what on? What about on Earth? What can we do about this? Um, this is a picture here taken of the planet Uranus um, with adaptive optics off and on. You can see how blurry it is because of the atmosphere with the adaptive optics off. And when you click it on, look how clear 
the image gets. Okay, look how clear that image gets. You can see the clouds on the surface and everything. So that's an amazing feature. So what is adaptive optics? Basically, you adjust the mirror to counteract the blurriness from the atmosphere. And this is what an adaptive optics system looks like. All these little actuators can push and pull the mirror and bend each part to try and clear the image up. There's another one. You can see all the different elements that can move and shift. Um, that's an animation showing how you can bend. Uh, you know, this is a whole mirror. It's made of smaller segments, and you can bend an individual part of it to try to clear an image up. How do you actually measure the atmosphere? With this laser. So sometimes you'll see these pictures of telescopes and these lasers shooting out into the sky. The laser is actually measuring the atmosphere from there out. And then the laser gets reflected back down. They measure the turbulence in the atmosphere that the laser experienced and then use the mirror system to compensate for that and it clears the images right up. So that's adaptive optics and that is so you know that why are we building Earth-based telescopes instead of space-based telescopes. It's because we no longer need to put them in space. We can get rid of the problems of the atmosphere with computers and adaptive optics. Okay, so um, 6.3 is about um, uh, learning how telescopes work, basically the CCD and the photographic plate, and then describe the difficulties associated with infrared observations, and then describe how a spectrometer works. So there are two shortcomings to using our uh, eyeballs to study stars. Number one, our eyes have small pupils, small apertures. Number two, our brain takes light in and processes it quickly. So that's our exposure setting. Um, so our eyes have what we call a short integration time. In photography, it's called exposure, and it basically measures how long film is allowed to collect a light for. Um, and you can see if you have a slower shutter, it allows more light in as you shorten the amount of time that the film is exposed to the image it's trying to take, it collects less light and the image gets darker and darker and darker. If you go longer and longer and longer shutter speeds, sometimes your image is completely washed out and everything looks very bright and white. So you gotta have a nice balance um, to, to measure that. So this is what we're talking about with shutter speed. This is what, you know, your eyeballs will see something like this. You cannot see like this, you cannot see like that. Sometimes when you go from a light environment to a dark environment, it takes a little while for your eyes to adjust. What are you adjusting? Basically the integration time. So it takes about 30 minutes for your eyes adjust to a, a dark sky at night. So if you want to go observing and you're a little bit disappointed, wait 30 minutes and let your eyes really adjust and you just start to see all the stars, okay? Um, so that's, we want to be able to control that. And the invention of a camera uh, made our ability to see faint things even better than just with a telescope because now we can let a uh, film absorb a lot of photons and see crazy things. This is the first ever picture um, of an astronomical object. It was the moon and that's a photographic plate. So photography opened the door to modern astronomy. Astronomers could create permanent images and study them later of, and not just pictures but also spectra using spectrometers. Um, we could see objects too faint to observe before, and then the invention of the CCD or the digital camera uh, just made things a lot better. So what is a CCD? It stands for charge coupled device, more efficient than film, um, it's easier to work with. You record light on pixels, um, photons create the signal and then in that pixel and then you use that to create an image. A CCD stands for charge coupled device. It utilizes the photoelectric effect when a photon strikes the surface, knocks an electron off, and that's how you measure whether a photon hit that pixel or not. Um, the electron is recorded, registered at the time and the place of where it hit, and then you reconstruct the image uh, that way. So you can see photons beep, 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 hitting this pixel that gets read out um, and then shifted out to the chip and it's processed. This is what a CCD looks like. It's kind of hard to tell that it does anything. It looks magic, like magic. If you zoom way in on a CCD, you see the red, green, and blue pixels, RGB, and that's what makes a color image. Um, before you had color image, you had black and white, uh, just light-sensitive uh, film and light-sensitive uh, things, but adding the ability to detect different colors. 
So when, when I mentioned earlier that some cameras have filters on them to reconstruct a color image, that's what each one of these little pixels has a little tiny filter on it to only accept green light, only accept blue light, only accept red light, and then you reconstruct the true color image that way with your software. Okay, so that's your CCD system. I'm not going to talk too much about this, right? You just got your pixels here. You've got your ADC, the analog to digital conversion. Um, you've got memory. You've got some processing going on and then little, all this stuff uh, that's going on in your iPhone or whatever to take pictures. So this is what a typical astronomical CCD looks like. You've got a lot of different um, areas for different sensors um, to do different Things. Sometimes you've got a spectrometer going on to here, you've got visible light going on here, maybe a different spectrometer here, uh, maybe this is collecting all the light. Um, so just this looks like the one for Kepler, yeah, this is the Kepler telescope. Each one of these areas was responsible for a different part of the sky. Um, so uh, pretty cool. That's what a CCD is. All modern cameras utilize a CCD, okay, and this is for example, in an iPhone system, look at all those lenses come smashed into one little area, and there's your CCD that goes at the back. Um, this is the uh, two camera system. You got a larger zoom, a shorter zoom, and now with the three camera system, you get the wide, ultra wide, and the telephoto all in there, separate systems. Because if you're going to put it into one um, camera system, you're going to have something that uh, looks like. Uh, you know, this, oh jeez, I'm sorry, hopefully that doesn't disorient you. Okay, so that you can change your, you know, zoom a lot there, but if you tried to put that on an iPhone, people would get mad, so you have to have three separate cameras so that it's not, uh, so you're not, uh, you know, doing, you don't want your iPhone to be moving a lens off, right? Okay, so, uh, yeah. Oh boy. Blee. Oh boy. Okay, I think we're good. Hello. All right, so infrared radiation. Uh, this is about the problems associated with measuring infrared radiation. Infrared radiation, we, infrared radiation we think of as heat radiation, like the movie Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, you should watch that so you know my reference. It came out a long time ago. It's hard to see on Earth because Earth is a hot potato floating in space. So it's emitting infrared radiation all the time. So if you're trying to see infrared radiation from space, it's glowing all the way around you. So you have to create this shield to prevent infrared radiation from getting in. And then the other thing you have to do is everything radiates infrared, you and me and everything. Um, infrared telescopes, they are kept at near absolute zero, the detectors. Um, so they're usually bathed in liquid helium to keep them very cold so that the electrons are not vibrating and releasing infrared radiation while they're doing that. We call it background radiation. This is an example of infrared radiation. You've got a plastic bag here, your hands are inside it. I can't see it with visible light, but if you use an infrared telescope, you can see, or an infrared camera system, you can see the hands um, inside the bag. The bag is transparent to infrared radiation. It passes right through it. So that's a, a, an example of um, infrared radiation and why we like to use it, because let's say there's some clouds in the galaxy and we want to see through them, then we're going to need uh, infrared so that it'll penetrate that gas and we'll be able to see uh, more of what's going on inside. All right, so that's the challenges of that. Sometimes we want to study the spectrum of a star or an astronomical source. This is called spectroscopy, and we need to insert a diffraction grating or a prism into the beam. So to make the spectrum, like we talked about in the last lecture, to understand the fingerprints, to figure out what a star is made out of, or what a gas is contains in there. Then we use a prism. Um, there's another device called a diffraction grating. It does the same thing. It just splits light up into the rainbow. Um, so we take our telescope. Instead of looking at it, we put a prism, and then we look at it where the rainbow is created. So you got the light coming in. It goes on to your diffraction grating. You got a lens here. Actually, sorry, this is a slit to make the light uh, just a single um, beam, and then you've got another lens here, and there is your prism, and then the light gets split into its rainbow, and then another lens here to separate the light into its rainbow, and now you've got uh, a nice uh, uh, spectrum that you're looking at. If you did not have the prism in there, this is where you'd put your eye to take your picture. Um, 
So that's just how a spectrometer works. Now let's talk about radio telescopes. We want to describe how radio waves from space are detected, and we want to identify the world's largest radio telescopes, and then define this technique called interferometry to discuss the benefits of what are called interferometers um, over a single dish telescope. So here's a telescope, right? This is a, what type of telescope is this? You should know. A refractor. Very good, I'm impressed. This is a Cassegrain. So yeah, these are telescopes you know and love, and maybe. Uh, there's another telescope you're used to seeing. That's a binoc binocular telescope that's got two eyes. Um, that's a telescope. This does not look like a normal telescope, but it is a telescope. It's called a radio telescope. Uh, there's another radio telescope. Here's another radio telescope. This is a very large radio telescope, Arecibo. Um, this is the new radio telescope in China. They built this thing in the middle of nowhere and are having trouble getting scientists to work there because it's in the middle of nowhere in China. Um, but it is a absolutely massive radio telescope. Very cool instrument. Um, here's another one. So the, the point is these are telescopes too. They have feelings too. Radio telescopes can be used to see radio waves and one of the coolest uh, sources is this uh, supermassive black hole spitting out these jets of energy and you can see as the jets go out they kind of collect so it's like these streams of particles and then they slow down out here and they collect so you get this at the center of that is a supermassive black hole called Cygnus A this galaxy it's a radio galaxy um, these jets of energy, it's really crazy, more than 160,000 light years long, that's longer than our galaxy. Um, so this is, this. these are huge jets. Um, this is me as an undergrad, this is the radio telescope in North Liberty, Iowa. It's not far from Coe College, it's not far from Iowa City either. So it's there, you can visit it, you can walk around on the dish, um, it's pretty cool. I mean, you, you should ask first. Uh, but you can see this is part of what's called an interferometer, uh, which is when you combine or interfere uh, multiple telescopes into one. Um, so each of these things tries to measure the same signal, and then we combine it together to create a telescope which would be this big. So it's hard to build a planet-sized telescope, but if you have lots of telescopes spread around the planet, you can simulate or at least interpolate between them to try to recreate the overall signal. So this is an interferometric, interferometric array. This is, uh, you can see, this is as if you built a telescope that large. Um, it gives you the ability to just kind of uh, sample the, the, so you don't have to build as big of a thing. That's what an interferometric array does. It combines the signals from many individual telescopes into one, and it improves the quality of the data um, and allows you to do a lot of other things. The Event Horizon Telescope is a network, a global network of satellites, uh, sorry, of radio telescopes um, that were used to try to take the picture of a black hole, and they did. And this was the picture, uh, you might have heard about this. Um, there it is. That is the event horizon of the, tele of the black hole. So um, you needed a telescope the size of the planet to resolve that level of detail, uh, but they did it. So um, this is amazing, and there's the picture, and we're going to get more about that um, soon. Okay, so those are, there's a list here of the telescopes, the big telescopes, and interferometry and what it's useful for, uh, and so on. Okay, so... We want to get above the atmosphere sometimes because, um, so in this chapter we want to list the advantages of making astronomical observations from space. We want to explain the importance of the Hubble Space Telescope and we want to describe some of the major space-based observatories that astronomers use so that you're aware of this. So remember this, you've got gamma rays, x-rays, UV light, visible light, infrared, microwave, radio waves, all the different types of radio or of electromagnetic radiation that arrives at the Earth most of it is absorbed by the atmosphere. Only radio waves and visible light makes it to the surface. So all of the telescopes on Earth are either going to be radio telescopes or visible light telescopes. But let's say we want to study x-rays. 
let's say there's a galaxy emitting x-rays and we want to look at it and figure out what's doing that or gamma rays or or uv or infrared or microwave or any of these things what do we need to do well we need to put a telescope into space to get it above the atmosphere so the only reason we put telescopes in space not to get them closer to anything but to get them above the atmosphere so there's um, a bunch of telescopes here this is uh, one of them Sophia it's a uh, on a plane in NASA, they fly way high in the atmosphere. It's an infrared telescope. Um, there's space-based telescope. That's Hubble, um, which has a little bit of UV, a little bit of IR, mostly visible light. The Chandra X-ray telescope studies X-rays. The Spitzer Space Telescope does infrared. Uh, there's a new telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, I'll show you a picture of, which will is also an infrared telescope. Um, in order to see X-rays, we need to put them above the atmosphere. The Chandra X-ray telescope is really, really uh, uh, productive telescope. This is what it looks like before its wings were extended. Um, there's its solar panels extended. Um, this is the X-ray telescope. So inside the telescope, how do you take a picture of an X-ray? You know that if you've ever gotten an X-ray, you stand in front of a camera, they shoot X-rays into you, and then you have film that develops behind you. Um, an X-ray telescope doesn't have mirrors, so how do you collect x-rays and focus them like a lens? Um, basically, x-rays do not bounce boop, off a mirror like lower energy photons do, but if you can imagine throwing a stone into the lake, bloop, and it makes a bloop, um, you know that if you throw the stone at a glancing angle, instead of going through the lake, It'll bounce off the surface of the lake, skipping rocks, okay? So you can do the same thing. You can skip x-rays off of a metal surface and focus light that way. So x-ray telescopes are, the x-rays are skipped across the surface. And so x-rays come in and the mirrors are actually these circular uh, layers. And the light ray comes in, pink, 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 and gets bounced, pink, 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 and just kind of skipped into the detector and uh, so that's a really neat uh, construction but uh, so that's your x-rays come in and the mirrors are basically just slight angles away from the scattered x-rays to, to, fo to focus them into a point so that's how Chandra uh, focuses x-rays and collects them okay so the future of telescopes um, we want to describe the next generation of ground and space-based telescopes, explain some of the challenges involved in building these, and uh, this is the James Webb Space Telescope. So this one's it has been delayed, it should be launched soon, um, it's going to be a big deal, it's the precursor, not the precursor, it's the, um, what's the word for it, it comes after Hubble, uh, it's the next generation space telescope, it is infrared, because we don't see infrared on Earth, so the only reason to have a new space-based telescope is if it sees uh, in the infrared to study infrared objects. So this thing will be able to peer. My apologies. I mm, this thing will be able to see the edge of space and infrared galaxies. So this will be able to see very far into the distance and allow us to study the early universe in a lot more detail. The downside or the difficulty in building this thing is that it is going to. Okay, so when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, it had astigmatism. The images it produced were blurry. So they had to do a mission um, to go up and put glasses on Hubble. It was a big deal and Congress almost didn't do it uh, because it wasn't guaranteed that it would work. It did work, we were lucky, but um, the challenge with the James Webb Space Telescope is that it, it is not orbiting the Earth like Hubble. That was easy, we could just take a space shuttle up, uh, relatively easy, it was accessible, you take a space shuttle up, astronauts go fix it, and um, then uh, uh, astronauts go and uh, fix it, and uh, everything's fine. So James Webb Space Telescope is going to orbit really far away from the Earth in a point that we cannot fix it. We cannot do anything to it. So it needs to work perfectly. Otherwise, it will not work at all. So that's a, that's a challenge to get the James Webb Space Telescope up, is everything has to be tested and work flawlessly on Earth before we send it into space, and then it's kind of a fingers crossed type of deal uh, once it gets there that you, you thought of everything, your unknown unknowns. 
Now the 30 meter telescope is a new visible light telescope being built in uh, Hawaii. Um, you know, every time I teach this course on the uh, idea forms, there's a uh, a question on um, cultural. You know, how much did the course focus on uh, cultural or looking at different perspectives from different um, cultures and societies and, and and questions about that? And most of the time, people you know put that we don't talk about it because it's not what this course is about, but this is a great uh, topic for that. This telescope, um, the people that wanted to build it just thought they could just go in there and build it. Um, but where they want to build it is traditionally sacred land uh, for the uh, local inhabitants of Hawaii there. And the local inhabitants were a little bit railroaded by the um, committee that was going to build this thing. And the reason that it's turned into a really big deal is because they, the designers and builders and the governments that were involved in picking the location, did not get buy-in from the locals. And uh, so there's a huge fight um, that was exacerbated by not, res not, in my opinion, not showing enough respect for uh, the people uh, that uh, live in that area. So this is a really good, if you want to read about this, it may or may not get built. Um, it's currently being planned and it probably will eventually get built, but there's a lot of protest, a lot of fighting, a lot of court battles, um, because I think um, there wasn't enough uh, respect shown to the people that they, whose land they were uh, going to be using uh, to build this thing. Okay, so uh, uh, I recommend reading about that um, and just getting... That's uh, kind of a big deal, actually, right now in astronomy. There's a, it's a kind of creating a couple of camps, you know, either for and against type of thing. So uh, that is the uh, chapter on telescopes. If you have any questions, let me know. Write them in the comments. Otherwise, uh, read these key terms here. There's only, you know, a dozen or so. And then these summary sections. And uh, if you want to learn more, there's all these uh, further reading things. Okay, see you guys later. Bye.